I did some background work. I did some contextual work for all the speeches oh, good. Uh, with some of the references that you might not have been familiar with. Um, so what I was thinking of doing is uh, going through and giving you that which I have done and then discussing those documents. Is that acceptable? Sure. Okay. okay. Um, because I do want to give more time for discussion than uh, I normally do. <laughs> um, so the reason I chose these documents is number one, the span of time of Lincoln's uh, public life. And number two, because I think they really reflect his underlying philosophy and uh, sense of himself, right? And how he approached solving problems. So um, we will start with the Lyceum one. Who read the Lyceum? Okay, so we probably have a lot to say about this one. And this one I think is timeless in a way. It goes, brings us to our time as well. And there's significant background on it. Um, so the immediate context, uh, start with the immediate context, the overall context, and then into the immediate context, which she references some aspects of, is the incredible increase in violence on the, in the 1830s. The um, historians generally say that uh, relative to the teens and the 20s, there was much more uh, mob activity um, in the 1830s. Uh, and you saw that, and the significant point that Lincoln makes is it's all over the country. It's mm -hmm. not simply in the South. Uh, so my first slide is the race riots in Philadelphia in 1834. This, these were uh, sparked by the uh, by a rumor that a black man had insulted a white man on a at a merry-go-round or something like that, and it was trivial. It just was a, a match in a tinderbox. I mean, the other aspect of the '30s, besides what to the, I should say, one thing reason that some people attribute the increase in violence too, is the beginning of a huge wave of immigration from Europe, mm -hmm. um, which increases in the 40s and the 50s, particularly with the potato famine and revolu failed revolutions and so forth. Um, and then um, also uh, the agitation of the founding of the national anti-slavery movement by Garrison which is a totally different quality than the anti-slavery activity prior to that. So uh, the so you had these race riots in Philadelphia. You had something called the Five Points Riot in New York, uh, which was also, I mean, these went on day for days and resulted in things. And they weren't started by, I believe the New York one was started by an abolition speech, but not all of these. Uh, one of the later ones in the 40s in Philadelphia was and led to torching of buildings and so forth. But these things were generally rumors. So, um, and then the last thing, of course, is I couldn't find pictures or more on the southern the Louisiana and Mississippi events, riots that he mentioned, but. Uh, but certainly there's a lot on the Lovejoy murder, mm -hmm. which, which is where right there in Illinois uh, and what we've got. This is them destroying the press. They had already destroyed the press in St. Louis and he moved to Alton and then uh, he ended up um, trying to stop them. Apparently he was killed, shot while trying to stop them from destroying the press. It wasn't burned in a building or, or something of that sort. So that's the immediate context of, of 
Lincoln saying, look, we have a problem here with uh, being able to have reconciliation of differences uh, without this mass violence. The broader context, some of which I mentioned, the immigration, the, the abolition, uh, was a, goes back to the time of the revolution when the founding fathers were very concerned with mob rule, right? Uh, not that there wasn't such a thing in the revolution uh, at certain points. This is Alexander Hamilton outside uh, the home of the president of Colombia, um, who was going to be hard and feathered or killed <laughs> um, in a uh, revolutionary, uh, by a revolutionary mob. Right? And he had no particular love for this guy. He was with the Sons of Liberty himself and so forth and so on, but he didn't believe in resolving things in this way. So he actually harangued the crowd. This guy was physically bold as well as uh, a... Uh, as well as in writing. So he uh, is out there and talks and talks. I mean, he doesn't succeed. They ultimately get in the house, but the, mm. the president's been able to escape by that time and uh, not get killed. So, or injured as he might have been. So this fear was very prominent. It was prominent in the Federalist Papers. You know, the, uh, this is Madison. Um, I don't know, well, those of you who have read the document, he, when he says violence of faction, he means mobs, right? And he said, you know, you have to worry about, you. the form of government we are trying to put together is one that will avoid a majority mob dictating policy. Um, the instability, injustice, and confusion is a mortal disease under which popular governments have everywhere perished. Now, where did they, and they called it mobocracy. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there was a shift very discernible in the, with the Jackson administration in that direction. Uh, this is not the picture that I put in my later version. Uh, it, this is a picture of the masses who attended his inauguration. Because uh, the, the election in 1828 was the first Democratic Party election. It was, it was a, a massive increase in voter turnout. Uh, the, uh, it was a mobilization of the masses to make in the election, which didn't really happen earlier than that. Um, so this, the picture that I chose uh, after this was the destruction inside the White House that occurred because they had a big party, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody could huh. come in. Of course, everybody came in under Lincoln too, but, right. you know, in, in this case, they came in and, uh, and were drunk. Yeah. It was literally the people's house. It was the people's <laughs> house. It was, it was uh, taken over and uh, uh, made a mess of um, in the course of things. So this uh, was one of the aspects of what was going into the crisis. And of course, you know, Jeff, uh, Lincoln is an opponent of that kind of uh, activity. And the founding, the debate among the founding fathers with the Constitution, you know, was very much informed by going back to antiquity, to Rome and to Greece. Uh, you know, they made arguments about the fact that Rome was brought down by, uh, or its downfall was accompanied by a lot of mob violence. Mm -hmm. This is one that happened in 52. This is not a slave revolt. This is just going after the tribune of the people they didn't like at a particular, at the around the time of Cicero. Uh, so, uh, and uh, 
No, it was prior to. Not much. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, similar, similar. But this is mobs in the street destroying the, the, the city and so forth. And then the questions of ancient, uh, ancient Greece. Um, the, uh, I confess I'm a Platonist <laughs> um, and um, read a lot of Plato and he, in his Republic, goes through a whole discussion of kinds of government. And he is not keen on democracy because Athenian democracy was not what we consider democracy. We have a representative democracy. They had 6,000 people in a quorum in a room and they, uh, which would tend to be a little overwhelming if you're the opposition. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> nice secret ballot or something like that. Um, so the, uh, this is uh, not very great painting, but only one I could find uh, by David of, of uh, Socrates. Of course, he was condemned to death by the democracy. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, and the founding fathers, as far as I know, never made that point. But uh, it's not irrelevant to what uh, the situation is uh, occurred. So, but this, but all of the people, or most, many of the people who were involved in the deliberations on the state level and the national level uh, for the constitution itself were very familiar with all of this history and were studying it intently to try to say, as Hamilton said in the beginning of the Federalist Papers, you know, can we create a government? essentially de novo, right? We're creating a government, you know, without a history <laughs> on, on principles and, you know, what should they be and what are the pitfalls and so forth. I think it was not, uh, well, there is a context, it was not a knee-jerk reaction to the context. Um, and then just before we get what you guys think, um, you know, what were Lincoln's solutions? Uh, you know, he's first he bemoans the fact that the, the founding generation is no longer, well, they can't be brought back. Uh, and many of them, he said, were, were involved in a passionate way and not in a rational way uh, in forming the, the, uh, the country. But, you know, if we're going to, to actually come through the current disorders, uh, we're going to have to instill reason in the population. I think he constantly comes back to education, to the, uh, an idea that it is possible, and many people would not agree, it is possible to bring people to a level of deliberation and reason to manage their affairs. So now the floor is open. Oh, how are they going to be heard uh, in the recording? I don't know. Speak up. That's all. Well, I'm sorry. I was uh, doing my own thoughts here a little bit, but I, I guess what I was sh struck by is how important this is for today's world. We have the same kind of um, disregard perhaps of uh, the union and, and the idea that uh, when we start to disregard it or when we think that the, the laws are flawed and such, that people are now starting to not have relevant uh, reverence for uh, the union itself and the constitution. So I was just trying to find the phrase that, and I didn't underline it. It was just, it was a perfect discussion of today's world. I was wondering how they would be heard. Who? Well, they can be heard. No, yeah, I was wondering about how you guys can oh, be heard. Okay, I thought oh, okay. that's why I have a I agree with you. I thought that's you. what you asked. Oh, no, yeah, they're, they're, they're yeah, fine. I just always check, check in. Okay. I always check in. With Sandy, do you have something you want to say? Well, I, I certainly agree with Marcy. The, um, the timelessness of the speech 
uh, just, you know, can't be overstated. And in addition to that, I thought it was beautifully written. The flow was was just so pleasing. It made it easy to read the uh, phrasing that he used. You would almost hear his voice as as I was reading through it and um, how he spoke of, of, of education and of the importance of revering the law and um, and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and that the um, founding fathers had passion when they wrote that, but over time things would fade and new generations would come and we did not have to fear outside invaders so much as we had to fear ourselves if we allowed someone to, um, how did he put it? Um, I wrote it down someplace. Uh, and of course I can't find it after I wrote it down, but he spoke of, of someone who would appear and uh, be so full of his own um, passion for uh, the type of government that he would become powerful and that we needed to ensure that that did not happen. Yeah, that's over on the next to the last page, third to the last page. I was really impressed too with how it was written. I couldn't believe how intellectual it was compared to what we hear from our speakers today. I mean, our politicians, if they talk like this, they never get a vote. Never get a vote. I mean, times must have been really different in terms of what people, or either, either education was better. I mean, this was amazing to me. And he was talking to young people. He, yeah. This was not, he was not talking to a, a, an in-group. As right. far as I know, it was like yeah, a high school students, right? Yeah, I mean, I he, was, um, he did not have a lot of formal education himself. No, so, you know, I was I was taken by that too. I, I wondered if, if there were a lot of people that just wouldn't have understood what he was talking about. Even I started reading this out loud to Marty because I just couldn't believe it. The salubrity of climate. I mean, there are words I don't, I don't know right. exactly what they mean. I mean, it was, it was very, very well written and very interesting. But I, mean, I think there was a whole slew of people that were completely uneducated, but there were these people that chose to be educated regardless of their formal. He was self-educated a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah which, which really makes you wonder about formal education. I mean, you're, you're talking <laughs> I about... I think it makes <laughs> Yeah, I, I noted the same things y'all are noting, that the biggest threats... I noted in, my, in looking up this speech, like uh, in terms of what others have said about it, there's one part of it that's very much quoted often and sometimes misquoted. On that first page, if you've got it in front of you, the last paragraph, when he says, at what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. Yes. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of freemen, we must live through all time or die by suicide. But that's what made me think of today. Exactly. We're the biggest threat to ourselves. And apparently this is quoted a lot, but in a paraphrase sort of way. It wasn't exactly what he said, but it's sort of, sort of close. I like the fact that he talked about these mobs and things, not just in the South and not just in the slave states or the non-slave states. He really, in, in, this, in his remarks, you could see his dedication to the Union in the fact that he didn't try to blame one group or one section or one region or, or the other. He said, "We're all in this together. We have a, we have to we have to fix this." But the hanging, the, the, all the hangings that were going on, this was another thing about today. We just passed a law this week anti lynching, mm -hmm. and Lincoln's description of all the lynching that was going on. He says, "This process of hanging from gamblers to Negroes, from Negroes to white citizens, and from these to strangers, till dead men were dead men were seen literally dangling from the boughs of trees upon every roadside." and in numbers almost sufficient to rival the native Spanish moss of the country as a drapery of the forest. That's, that's incredible. a lot of, it's incredible writing. It's an incredible poet, poetic. It really style. is. But anyway, and he talks about the mobocracy, but he really makes it clear that he believes in the, the key thing is the rule of law. It really made me appreciate all this stuff so much more, reading, reading and thinking through this at the point of, from his point of view in this, in this year and time. 
And that he, he does stress that there could be bad laws, there could yeah. be unfair laws, but they don't, they shouldn't be changed by violence, uh, which I think explains how his approach later on to slavery when he got in office took place, how he how he worked through that. I thought it was just a tremendous, a tremendous speech. I don't know if I had anything on here. I loved it, just talking about how civil and religious religious how did he talk about this this, this should be our national religion our, oh our yeah he does. you know i'm talking yeah. about the political uh, yeah he said that that uh effectively the constitution and the declaration our founding uh documents should be like a national like a, a, a national religion this part about how the people who were part of the revolutionary movement were were gone had died and that they were they were important because they were our living history to remind us of the importance of law and the constitution and all these things, the declaration. And made me think about the Holocaust and how we talk about it and people who were in the, you know, in these various uh, horrible or, or good events, we talk about the sadness on the and the concern about the last people dying off in those who had direct experiences. And then all we have to go on is other stuff, and we have to to, to keep it alive some other way. Fascinating. You know, as much as we're impressed by it, I mean, his whole reputation is built on this. The beginning of the speech was yeah. uh, a launch pad for him. So, yeah, we weren't the only ones impressed. What does this last sentence of the whole thing mean? Is he talking about George Washington here? I think so. Yeah. Okay, I thought, I thought that's it was. my recollection. Okay. I'm not looking at it. I look at it. That is a Washington. We revered his name to the last. Yeah, yeah. During That's his long show, we awaken in our Washington. the last Trump show, awaken our Washington. I think that meant George Washington. Yeah. Right. yeah. But when he says, be. but then when he says, as truly has been said, of the only greater institution, the gates of hell. Yeah. That's that the rock. That's he's talking about the Constitution. And so sad that he himself was killed by not. Not a monocracy, like but, but a terrible violence that was not law that was not lawful, of course. How is it that they are only getting around to um, outlaw lynching now? What was all those years in between? Uh, let's not get into that. That could yeah. take us the rest of the <laughs> class. That it, could take us the rest strange. of the class. You know, it's been outlawed. It just wasn't a federal outlaw. Oh, yeah, yeah. In some yeah. states, federal yeah. Law. It's the difference between federal law and okay. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> state law, <laughs> and it, and murder is still illegal in most places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it is murder. I mean, so okay. Uh, so okay. Can we move on to number two? So this. Speech, discover, discoveries, and inventions was initially introduced to me by a friend who wrote a book on the Civil War, um, an African American man, uh, who, who introduced it as Lincoln's favorite stump speech. <laughs> now, when you look it up on the internet, on you know Google, the God Google. Um, you get a totally different pitch on it that he, you know, that Lincoln thought it was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it is relevant in my view because of its uh, outline of a view of mankind, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what mankind is uh, and Again, the emphasis on human creativity, invention, and you know the necessity for people to think and and invent in order to for our society to proceed. Mm -hmm. Now, there is some background here that you are undoubtedly unaware of. But let's go on. Um, the immediate context is the rise of a movement in. America, which I mean, you won't find much of anything at all on Google and Wikipedia on this. It's a group called Young America. You will hear about 
young Germany, young France, young England. There was an international movement in Europe uh, of young people saying, uh, you know, who were going up against the status quo. I get, you could call it populism, I suppose, but you know, this is what they called it. And it was also here in mostly centered in the Democratic Party circles. Um, it was a, uh, and Lincoln talks about it at the end of this, in the second part of the speech, which is probably, if you read this, how many people read this speech? Anybody? No. Okay. So this one's very much. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so I mean, number one, it's a, an allegorical speech. It's, he does it from the standpoint of, he, first he lays out a thesis, which is not allegorical. The thesis being that man is unique because while other creatures work, man improves his work by inventions and discoveries. So that's a difference. Okay. And then he purports allegorically to go through the history of discoveries, starting with the creation of the fig leaf as clothing. <laughs> so it's an appeal. This is also given to audiences in Illinois. Uh, you know, in the course 1858, it's prior to the campaign per se, but it's building up toward. Uh, what will be the presidential campaign. Um, the, uh, he is using the fact that many people are familiar with the Bible, right, to make a, uh, his allegorical presentation of the crucial importance of discoveries in the history of mankind. And so, uh, but, and who are his, the opponents of this approach that he mentions is this Young America group. Oh. Now, the Young America group, the most noticeable person, well, Stephen Douglas was associated with it, but the most notable person who was elected president on mm -hmm. this basis was James Polk. Mm -hmm. And what was James Polk doing? James Polk was the guy who started the war in Mexico, against Mexico. Uh, what, he, what, what Lincoln says young America represents is number one, a rejection of knowledge of previous generations. They say, it's, we're the ones, you know, we're new. We're, you know, we're great. You know, it's America. Don't worry about those old fogies. This, I believe, is where the term old fogey comes from. <laughs> Don't worry about the uh, those guys from the past. What did they know? You know, we're the young adventurers. We're moving west. We're building the country, uh, etc. So, and you know, we know what's right. And therefore, we're going to intervene internationally to spread what's right. There are people associated with Young America who are involved in, believe it or not, everything comes around invasions of Cuba. Wow. Uh, and the invasion of Mexico, both of which were also associated, and this you do not see in the uh, write ups in Wikipedia at all that I could find. The expansion of slavery. So now, and in fact, the lead one of the two acknowledged leaders of the group in America, a guy named Edwin De Leon, uh, was headquartered in South Carolina. Uh, was uh, established a newspaper that was pro-slavery, uh, and was eventually when the Civil War broke out, came and offered his services to Jefferson Davis and became an official and so forth. Um, prior to that, he was an official under the Pope, an ambassador under the Pope administration and so forth. So 
what he's so Lincoln is going after these people because they were a popular political force, but he doesn't do it in a political way. Hmm. He does it by way of their anti invention, anti. Uh, How would you say it? Uh, historical. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, rejecting history, we start from scratch, uh, anti intellectual in a yeah. certain way, yeah. you know, um, I guess you would say, but against the idea of prospering. This group now recall that Polk also was against federal support for. Uh, infrastructure development. Hmm. He's against spending federal, gov federal government money for uh, internal improvements. So that is in the background of this as well. Hmm. So it's interesting, I never noticed this before. <laughs> I had always gone through the first part where he's talking about all the inventions. And then you get to the end and he's talking about uh, this in a, relatively polite way, but nonetheless, an ironical attack on these guys saying, well, if they run into a problem, all they do is say, let's go west. You know, we run into a problem, we try to solve it with science and technology and, and thinking about it, right? Interesting. Um, the, uh, and it, it has heavy funding from Great Britain, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so Horace Greeley was not really a total uh, representative of that group. Uh, the reason that I mention him is because he's the guy associated with the expansion to the West, right? But expansion to the West was a, something that was wanted by all factions, as far as I know. The question is what kind of expansion to the West and the, uh, um, the overall, this I did find in the Wikipedia write-ups, who basically say that young America was for uh, railroads and other kinds of improvements and commercial activity rather than just farming like the Jackson background which is undoubtedly true because they were uh, a big free trade uh, lobby. Uh, but the, the bottom line on that is saying no federal government support for your industry. So therefore, um, that's why I say I go west against internal improvements. Uh, that's the import of what uh, Lincoln is saying. Now, the broader context I basically go through is uh, what he has to say, which interestingly enough, the areas of invention that he brings up very much parallel some of Hamilton's mm -hmm. areas uh, in the report on manufacturers. The first of which is clothing. She said every country should, Hamilton said every country should have the ability to clothe itself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and as I said, Lincoln starts with inventing the figure uh, and then going on and on about uh, the inventions. And then he goes to iron production uh, and goes back to how early iron production was actually developed and uh, what was required for the building that had to be done. Uh, transportation. He starts with transport uh, with the the rivers and moving in that way and obstructions over rivers, bridges, and then he says, and now, but now we're dealing with it in uh, with rail. steam power. This is fascinating. He says back in back as early as the Egyptian Empire, there were toys that utilize steam power that blew the top off the toy. So, so why, if they knew that this would work with toys, why didn't they use it for 
something productive that we need. And remember, well, don't remember because you don't, you haven't read it, but uh, a speech he gave the same year at the Wisconsin State Fair has a major emphasis on increasing the productivity of agriculture by a steam plow, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we want to develop. Um, so there's a steam plow um, that he shows. So it's just a totally different orientation to politics than what uh, the young America people were having, which was to excite everybody about, you know, being an American and moving west and, you know, and intervening uh, in other parts of the world. They didn't explicitly say this is to expand slavery, but in numerous places, that's where it was. Mm -hmm. But that's what it was for, which Lincoln was very much aware of. And then the last part is the written word, that the bent, again, an education focus, that the way that we are able to proceed with these inventions and discoveries is because knowledge is passed on with the written word. If that hadn't happened, you know, we're, you know, we would all be starting a new. So, and I put Shakespeare up there because it's every, as I think you all know, just by vocal, uh, Lincoln was such a Shakespeare addict. Know that. Uh, no, oh no, he, he loved poetry and, and he loved Shakespeare. And he loved the tragedies in particular. <laughs> and then he concludes with an idea, well, how should we think about America relative to these points, right? Uh, we have to think of ourselves as being the ideal country to favor and facilitate mm -hmm. useful discoveries and solutions. Why did he consider this speech uh, unsuccessful? Well, I don't know that he did. That's oh. what it says in Wikipedia. Oh, okay. but, you know, he gave it numerous times. And uh, so he obviously didn't think it was unsuccessful, unsuccessful yeah. from the beginning. Yes? I think it's also in that um, University of California, Santa Barbara site. It says the same thing is that he thought it was a, a commonplace speech. Right. And there was really? nothing that was clearly not what you think, Nancy, but it was that was yeah. what was right. yeah, yeah, that's what and that's not necessarily what they thought, it's just what they captured from what he thought. That's interesting. Yeah. They say yeah. that's what he thought. Okay, yeah. uh, I'm not gonna spend more time on this because yeah. you guys read it. So we're gonna go to the biggie. How many, who read some of the Alton debate? Anybody? You were all intimidated? No. I read about four times. <laughs> I didn't get past Stephen yes, Douglas. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, well, I, I skimmed Stephen Douglas and then read Lincoln. <laughs> And then yeah, didn't, I, I did that. not read the rebuttal. <laughs> uh, you know, the way these things went, I think, what was it? An, was it an hour Woo. for the opening, an hour and a half wow. rebuttal, and then a half hour Closings? closing mm -hmm. by the initial guy. Wow. So this wow. was, and you had to remember it all, right? Well, it was interesting, they sold train tickets for a dollar. Right. To go to the debate. Really? Yeah. Like 5,000. 5,000 people. Yeah. Although that was a smaller one, apparently. They said, you know, this, the Alton, this was the last debate, right? The reason I chose this debate is because it was the last one. So, and as you may have noticed, Lincoln loves to quote himself, right? <laughs> Verbatim, you know. And I, well, I can't say it any better than I said it, you know, <laughs> at this yeah. one. So let me. Uh, the topic of this debate. Well, it's, the topic of all the debates is really the deck all men are created equal. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. I mean, in my view, yeah. uh, having some time ago, 10 or 15 years ago, read the, 20 years ago, read the entire. I read it from beginning to end, mm -hmm. um, and and all the details aside, to me that's what comes through. Um, yeah. Now, but let me give you a little background on this one too. 
see. This uh, we, my husband has relatives near St. Louis, so we went to Alton, and this is uh, a uh, depiction of the debate. The little giant holding forth. So the immediate context was, of course, the Kansas and Nebraska Act, which was a a overturning explicitly, I didn't realize it was explicitly, of the Missouri Compromise. Yeah. Uh, what? Missouri Compromise. Oh, it eliminated any legal barrier to the expansion of slavery on the half, behalf of the federal government. And, and said that every territory and state can decide for itself. Mm. And this resulted in uh, people of both sides coming from all over the country to the Kansas Nebraska territory and violence to erupting in uh, full, well, they called it bloody Kansas, right? Mm. Bleeding, bleeding Kansas. Kansas. Bleeding Kansas. So that was the immediate context because Stephen Douglas was the author of the Kansas Nebraska Act. What was the date of the debate? This was in, it's the last one, October 1858. It's the same year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they must have always held them in, in the uh, good weather because I, yeah. I mean, there must have been no place for them to sit. They must, they must have still have been. That's, I think it's amazing. They're so <laughs> wimpy in comparison yeah. to those people. Well, what I'm trying to find out is how you get 10,000 people to be able to hear you without, without That's true. a megaphone. I'm told that he had a very high squeaky voice. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that, it's sort of incredible that, to think that. And he did have a very high squeaky voice. But I also think their expectations were a hell of a lot lower than ours. We want, sure. you know, some phonic quality. In this is very good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Air conditioning, you know. Right. right. That's true. Food, drinks. Some and then, of course, the Dred Scott decision had also occurred, which was an attempt on the part of the Supreme Court to, to you know, say, from their standpoint, uh, that, uh, you know, that Blacks could not be citizens. Um, Even when it's like a hangman. Yeah, yeah, I know. He does. He does. So, uh, so those are the immediate background, now. and these are the main points of contention. I let Lorraine say. Oh, I can't. I can't do that. I only. I. I didn't even have a physical copy of it. I had to just read it online. So. Well, I read I it online too that. because I thought printing it out was a waste. But the, too much the paper. main thing was he was talking about uh, slavery as a. Um, uh, an obstacle to unity, unification of the country, which he's all for. That he says that I think he said that even if the whole country, if everybody decided that slavery was okay, that he would go along with it. He didn't like it, but that he would accept it. But what he says is that you can't have some of the country with slavery and other parts of the country opposed to it because mm -hmm. it eventually creates this terrible conflict. And they also said that he didn't believe there should be any um, increase in it. That he, I think he said that he wouldn't, um, he wouldn't fight with the with states that already had slavery. He, he believed that it was not constitutional to interfere right. with the slavery right. in the states where it existed when the Constitution was ratified. Right. But his firm belief, which is reiterated here, was that. The uh, people at the time, even slaveholders, believed that it was evil, number one, yeah. and a necessary evil, so-called, and number two, that it was on its way to extinction. Extinction. Okay. And, and that's what and the that he believed, was. and he believed, as, as Frederick Douglass believed, and I'm sure many others believed, and that he disagreed with, that the decision in the Constitutional Convention to talk about 
eliminating the slave trade, but the elimination of slave trade would cut it off because you needed to have expansion to, to uh, there was expansion, but it, you know, when they cut, up, cut that off, it expanded in another way. But anyway, let me, uh, I have a slightly different uh, way of looking at that. Uh, of the three issues here. The first issue was, does Congress have power over what the territories can do? And that is in which the Kansas-Nebraska Act and Douglas in these debates says that it should not. The people in its popular sovereignty, the people where you are should be able to decide what they do. And he even makes argument and he cites and notice Jefferson Davis made this argument too you know he was a senator at the time and he was going around speaking you know well this doesn't mean that you can't uh, discourage slavery in a territory right if you're if you have local laws that make that discourage it no slave owner will come out of there it just was crazy but anyway um so the uh, so what Douglas was saying and what the Kansas Nebraska Act did was directly go against the the constitutional provision that says power that, con that uh, Congress has the power to dispose of what happens in the territories. He said, "Well, that's that's history. <laughs> that's whatever." Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was one of the major points of disagreement. The second was, what did it mean to say all men are created equal? Mm -hmm. And then I believe we went through before. Uh, Lincoln said, and he quotes himself again, right. saying, when they said this, well, number one, he goes to this thing that says, no one before Stephen Douglas or and Dred Scott and Tani ever said that it didn't include blacks. I don't know that that's true or not, but that's what Lincoln says. Uh, they thought it included everyone, but in a particular respect, right. in the respect of being able to, you know, have a living to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's not citizenship. Necessarily, that's not. I mean, in his view, I'm not. He does. He says that they never used the word in the Constitution. No, they never used. Never it. used the word black or Negro or slave or. No, they did not. And he said that was because they didn't want to go back. They didn't want history to look back after slavery is gone. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the country to be able to look back and say that here's this thing on slavery uh, that was enshrined in our founding document, that they were too embarrassed. I mean, and it is the case. I mean, Madison made the point in his uh, write-ups that you know we will not uh, put anything in here. And there were votes that took out the word slavery, which mm -hmm. were proposed. Mm -hmm. The um, no property in man. Man is not property. How do they state the clause that says the slave trade would end in 1808? I didn't bring because they couldn't have used the word slave, so they had to use no, no. Else. They said persons. Persons who, of bondage. Pers no, no, not persons no. of bondage. Persons who are imported. Uh, in, it's very elliptical language. Uh, okay. Does anyone have a constitution in front no, of them? I, I used to, I I used to carry one around with me all the time, and I think it got so tattered, I, you know, uh, I, I didn't. It's too bad John Splane's not in class. He would he pull out his yeah. copy out of his pocket. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm sorry. I This is, this is a very big, uh, oh, no, there it is. There it is. Good oh, for you. There it is. It's tiny, but I don't realize. Small print. Yeah. The only place where it's even close to being mentioned. I don't remember where it is. 
and I think it's under oh, it's under the it's under the section one. Can we do it? No, 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 no. Do not do that. We're okay. that's against the. Our Lincoln Douglas debates the, in the uh, format. We for those of you who read it, are these debates in the format that we hear now, where it be it resolved, it starts with a resolution? No. And then once no. before and once against. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. That's Not finding it. I guess you better look out uh, where. Oh, oh, here it is. Here it is. Section nine. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit <laughs> shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808. But a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. That never happened. Right? They Debated it, debated it, yeah. but you know. In fact, they call it importation rather than importation. Yeah, migration or importation. So, oh, I'm glad I have that. Good for you, Dad. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, Douglas said outright that they didn't mean blacks. Yeah. Lincoln said, you know, you can't show me where anybody said that. <laughs> and I believe that they uh, included everybody, although in certain respects, right? Uh, the, uh, and he goes through, as I think I mentioned before, when you get to uh, the Cooper Union speech, oh no, that has to do with the territorial powers. But anyway, he goes through uh, examples of how uh, this is the case. And then he said, but the fundamental issue is, is slavery wrong? This is at the very end. And he actually says that is the real issue. The issue will continue. Eternal struggle between prince, two principles. And this really impressed me to summarize. I mean, this is the summation of the entire mm -hmm. event. And what, what Douglas is doing is sniping, right? Yeah. Because Douglas said officially that he didn't believe in slavery. Huh. Uh, but as Lincoln mocks him here, he said, well, you can say you don't believe it, you believe it's wrong, but if you never attack anybody else who's expanding it, and if you never, and if you object to those who are campaigning about it being wrong, and if you do this and that, you know, how am I to believe you really think it's wrong, right? Yes, yeah. um, Douglas, by the way, um, supported the Union in the Civil War. He did not uh, go over to the Confederates. It's a little difficult from Illinois to the Confederates. <laughs> well, yes. I have a quick question. I think I was to mention this to Bill. I know that the position is that Lincoln believed that all men were equal in the sense of life and the pursuit of happiness, but the intent was not equality. Right. Was there any concept, I mean, from all your research and readings, the concept of today that's what the situation would be at its best, but in the future, the concept would have been true equality. I mean, this is a Lincoln kind of... Well, question. yeah, he talks about cutting off the ability of blacks to grow towards citizenship potential. Doesn't he say that? Yeah, he place? talks about growing toward citizenship. So and improving themselves, which could you could be seen in that way, mm -hmm. right? He's not talking about creating a status. He's he's going against that mudsill idea, right? Of you know, there's a low level of society, and you're in that caste, and you're going to stay now. there yeah. forever. You know, he's talking about you. You know, you're cutting off their ability to advance, and you know that could very well have had uh, that meaning for him. Okay, that's good. That, okay, the 1862, and this Bruce is right. I did read this. Right. 
Um, so I will go quickly through the, the context and then we can discuss this. this is Anybody else read it? Yeah. Anybody read this? I did. <laughs> I reread it. Um, okay, immediate context. Less than one month before the, you know, he had announced it on September 22nd that he was going to do it. Uh, and it was happening, you know, less than a month in advance that it was hanging over everything. People were discussing it. You know, what is this going to mean? Is it going to be a disaster? Uh, is it going to cause race riots? Is it going to, you know, what is going to happen? Uh, this is an aspect you may not be aware of. In every annual address that I have that I read, all four, he begins with the international situation and reviews what our relations are with other countries. In this one, in fall of 1862, he references, although relatively obliquely, uh, the fact that there are worrisome signs from Britain and France. And the fact is that contrary to much of what you'll read about this period, the British and the French were seriously thinking about intervening. And they were in contact with the Russian Tsar, who was in support of the United States, trying to get, yeah, Lincoln had sent uh, an ambassador to Russia, Cassius Clay, an anti-slavery Kentucky, Kentucky, yeah. Um, so anyway, explicitly, Gladstone was explicitly uh, a, uh, saying we should intervene. On the side of the Confederates? On the side of the Confederates. Wow. Because they wanted to be protecting the cops. They wanted to the cops. Exactly. Cotton, breaking up the Union as well. But shortly after he started in Egypt at any case. Oh, well, they, they but, you know, the South, I mean, the, some of the South Carolinians thought, well, you know, we'll cut off uh, cotton and they'll be forced to their knees. Well, the point is you could get cotton from Egypt, you could get cotton from India, you could get cotton from Brazil, you know, not India, Brazil. And that's what they did. You know, that was an empire. You know? yeah. So anyway, this is one of the things that the British concretely did. Wow. They built this ship called the CSS Alabama, uh, and uh, and it's official. They later paid fifteen million dollars wow. in reparations for having done it. So this was very much on Lincoln's mind. I mean, remember the context for him deciding to do the Emancipation Proclamation was in large, you know, was heavily influenced by the that the war was not going well, and that you had to hurt the South by freeing themselves. Uh, the reason that that was important is not because he was against freeing the slaves, but because, as I said before, he believed it might be unconstitutional to free the slaves in, in Southern states. But the more important thing was saving the United States. And then the French were also on the move. They were down there, Maximilian was down there in Mexico, and they had deals with the Confederacy. They, you know, the famous Cinco de Mayo is a, is a celebration. It's really a Civil War battle. Yeah. Yeah. I learned that yeah. about a year ago. I always thought it was because of Mexican independence. I had no idea. And I looked it up, my Lord, this is like Bull Run in New Mexico. Wow. But, it's more fun. but it's strategic. Yeah. But it's strategically yeah. really a critical thing because the Mexicans in that one battle defeated the French. And the French, if they had not had that kind of resistance, would have were planning to send weapons to the Confederacy. Uh, part of that plan. I mean, this is important context for how Lincoln is thinking because he is not thinking narrowly you know, about right. an issue. He's not thinking even narrowly about the country. He's thinking about the global strategic situation. Where are we? So 
Can I ask about that? Is how much information does he get in real time? When what is his real time information? Good question. When how long does it take to get yeah. something? Well, they had developed the telegraph by this time. Yeah, in fact, they it was the telegraph was all around. That's true. Okay. So it's really pretty close to real time. Yeah. And I think they even had one going to Europe, or they were just yeah, saying, yeah. In this this thing, or, it's referenced. I think yeah, yeah. 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 That the telegraph to line to Britain is now up and running, or something mm -hmm. like or that. Or about to be. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah, so it was a lot more, it was a lot closer than you might yeah. have thought. Um, so I, I don't have too much else to say on this, except, you know, it was, cons it was compensated emancipation for the constitutional amendment. But a constitutional amendment that had to be ratified by some of the Confederate states as well uh, in order to meet the quota for it. So it was a little bit. So how long was this address? You read it, right? It's 15 pages, single type. Wow, that's <laughs> well done. And apparently, they, I, and apparently he delivered this one himself. It had been tradition for the president just to send it across with somebody from the staff to read it to Congress. Really? Um, this is essentially, we didn't realize it, but I got, this is the State of the Union. Yeah. They didn't call it the State of the Union address back then. Okay. They called it a report to Congress. Uh, but yeah. this is his annual State of the yeah. Union address. Yeah, and they, you know, he starts internationally, then he refers to the treasurer's report, he refers oh, to the, is so he, he refers to what the post office has done, he refers to what, wow. you know, the agriculture, the, the progress of the new Department of Agriculture, you know, he just, the he gives thing. a briefing, so-called, like military speaking, uh, on the state of the country. And he concludes with his, with this proposal. Um, the last thing that I have to say is just my very bare summary of what that uh, represents. One thing that might be, I think I went through before this section about uh, how white workers don't have to fear. Um, and then this very extensive discussion of the desire for population growth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Isn't there a touch of this in the Lyceum address? I mean, from there is this idea that war is not the answer, but rather um, that you can not do war and you can benefit. Or maybe yeah, I'm probably. Up. I think so. I mean, his, his position at 28 was not a heck of a lot different than how he executed his presidency. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking to me. I, that's why I think they think that's very important because it foreshadows, Absolutely. you know, that's the basis for all his subsequent actions and work. But so, what did you think, Bruce? Um, I started reading it. Uh, I got a uh, Third or fourth of the point, no, I got a third of the way through it, I just have to pause. And much of it's very dry. Yeah. Um, but they, and they said, oh, it was so famous because of what he said. Well, <laughs> and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll go through what I thought the whole thing. But what's famous is the last paragraph. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Can you read the last paragraph? Yes, but it's so different that, you know, I had the feeling that. Speech writers had written the other stuff, and then he wrote the last paragraph because it's That's it's emotional, and there was nothing emotional about the other stuff. Um, I'll read the last paragraph, yeah, but I think sure. other things are just as important because he shows some very troubling personal tendencies in my mind. Oh, really? Yeah, he doesn't think the Indians are of all people are created equal. It does not include the American Indians. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Wow. Um, the, he doesn't say that, but I'll read what he said about it. Okay, at the end of it, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fire fiery trial through which we pass all 
laying us down in honor or dishonor to the last generation. We say we are for the union. The world will not forget that we say this. We've heard that before. Mm -hmm. We know how to save the union. Oops. Know how to save the union. The world knows we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility in giving freedom to the slave. We assure freedom to the free. Honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just the way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. That's emotional speech, emotional talk. The rest of it's not. The rest of it's not. Um, hmm. Some other observations? Are, sure, sure. Because it's very non Lincolnian, some of it, I thought. Um, I'm going to throw up. He gives the financial stuff down to the penny. Well, <laughs> just, that's Hamiltonian. Now I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, we don't do that today because we can't count that many <laughs> pennies. A few billion here or there. Yeah. Um, oh, he also says that we should have a a federal currency, and they didn't have one. Right. And, and lo and behold, we have one in three weeks. Wow. So it didn't take long to. 1860. So, so, so it was 1863. Yeah. January. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's three weeks. Because yeah. right. this is this is on the eighth or something. It's December eighth. Wow. Right. Wow. Um, they did these things not in January like they do in, in December. Yeah. Huh. That's um, when Congress opened. Yeah. Yeah. And but I thought that was so obviously it was in the works already. They yeah. Had, oh, sure. Congress doesn't pass something that yeah. sweeping that quickly. Um, <laughs> oh, balance sheet goes on and on and on. Yes, it um, does. He's oh, he's, 12 pages of it, isn't he? he's, yeah. con he's concerned, he's concerned about the post office making money. I think oh that my is gosh. very, very topical. And then, in fact, yeah. it's not making money, it's losing money. Wow. And how are we going to fix this? <laughs> um, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, oh, and, terminal. yeah. And, and then. Jeez. It goes on quite a bit about the Homestead Act and what's and how that's going to enable us to expand and to develop natural resources um, out west. So he's pretty much in this western expansion. I, I, I think everybody was. It was yeah. just a question of how. How? Well, we would call that today periods. So uh, now. The Indian tribes upon our frontiers have during the past year manifested a spirit of insubordination and at several points have engaged in open hostilities against the white settlements in their pursuit. Wow. Um, and then he goes on saying with the, you know, that this must have been written by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was the Indian Bureau called in those days. Um, then he breaks the American Indians into the groups of peaceful people that live alongside. And then the other ones, which are fighting for their rights and freedom as insurgents. Wow. And uses the word insurgents. Um, information was received by the Indian Bureau from different sources about the time <laughs> hostilities were commenced that a simultaneous attack was to be made upon the white settlements by all the tribes between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. That this is a unified insurgency. It's, um, this doesn't sound really good. Um, and, and then he gets and then he goes into, of course, the the gist of it, and that and that is the essentially calling for. The abolition of state, what would turn what eventually becomes the 13th Amendment. 
Mm. But not the way that the 13th, I mean, the way he would have done it is much more gradual. Mm -hmm. um, he would have paid, he would have paid for, for it. Right. He, um, he, he said that, that the states all had, had up until the year 1900 wow. to, to abolish slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he didn't get into the idea of if one state does and the next state doesn't. So if you have slaves in one state and not the next, what happens when they go back and forth? Um, he's kind of skirts around that. He's interested in, in the evolution more than the, than the fine points. Um, he says that there will be... He's interested in stopping the bloodshed, really. Yeah. Sure, because he's in the middle of a war. Exactly. Yeah. He is in the middle of a war. But, but that's... That gets very little discussion in this. Um, the war itself? Yeah, because he... The, my guess was that he doesn't need to. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, I mean, if you if if you're in Ukraine right now, you don't need to tell everybody that they're in the middle of the war. Right. Right. And the <laughs> for for those that are concerned about being put out of work by the abolition, he, he goes to say that do not worry. Uh, the numbers are on our side. We're we are going to grow our population. Um, and then he says that we keep growing as we are right now. By nineteen hundred, by nineteen hundred, we would have a population of one hundred and three million two hundred and eight four hundred and fifteen people. <laughs> not four fourteen, not four sixteen. In, re in reality, it was a census too. In reality, even with all the new territories brought into the United States, our population in 1900 was not 103 million; it was 76 million. Right. So we didn't come close to no. what he said. And then he projects that how we will, the way we will grow was that we will outgrow um, the European nation by a great deal in that period. So he predicts that we would, well, um, that, that the population of Europe would be um, 70, yeah, 250 million um, in, by 1930. In reality, the population of Europe was 300 million in 1900. Whoa. So, uh, is he doesn't know. He can't look. He, he's looking forward, not backwards. But, but he's he certainly he certainly missed the mark on on all of those. Um, well, for for us, he was being optimistic. Yeah. You know? Yes. For them, he was it's being very, pessimistic. Very pessimistic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Don't forget, he's having he's having problems with most of the European continent at this time. Right, right, right. Um, he never was looked upon as being civilized enough, educated enough um, to take to suit the, at least the nobility and the people that ran the governments um, in in most of Europe. Um, so he's always he's. Always had a bit of a chip on the shoulder mm -hmm. aspect of him in that regard. Um, but like I said, and then it, you get done with all of the dry stuff, and then you get that last paragraph. That's very interesting. And it's yeah. from the heart. Yeah. That, that's very interesting. But let me just get to the end because I found something just yesterday I wanted to add it. Okay. Which I don't have here. I'm listening to the show. Better shoot me down now. No, I'm not going to shoot you down at all. Very I'm not going to shoot you down at all. Your your contribution is much appreciated. In, in, yes. Interested? I'm interested. Uh, don't necessarily totally agree, but I'm interested. Uh, okay, the second inaugural. So, what was happening at the second inaugural? This is just a silly picture. Probably the 
picture that looks makes Lincoln look more handsome than any other picture I've yeah. ever seen <laughs> because I don't think it looked like that at all. Well, I'm but sorry, anyway. I'm crazy, man. <laughs> this was a, sure not by then either. No. Uh, so the immediate context is Sherman is in North Carolina, right? Uh, they're already in September, he announced that the Atlanta had fallen. So, you know, he's he's on his way up. Right. But they still don't know, you know, for sure that the war is going to be over uh, imminently, but there's a sense that it might be, a sense that it might be. Uh, the Thirteenth Amendment has been passed, as it was said, you know, in January. In a very different, in a very different context. Yes, in a very different context. Simply, barely. Do, do you have any comment as to why the compensation for the slave owners, so to speak, got taken out of the equation? Well, I think it was put there in hopes of getting peace, and when they said no, mm. you know, who wanted to do it? I mean, I, I like the argument of there's a there's a guy, a, a southerner from North Carolina named Hinton Helper, who wrote a very controversial, very widespread book in 1860 called The Impending Crisis of the South. Mm -hmm. And it's a big attack, a, a, you know, no holds barred attack on slavery and how it's impoverished the South. And he goes through and he does has all these financial things in there, which some of which I think probably are pretty far out, but anyway, I mean, in terms of land values, in terms of, uh, you know, what could be, have hap could be the case if there weren't slavery. And one thing, he, so he goes through, you know, why pay the slave owners when they've already gotten free labor yeah. for all this time? The people we owe, uh, owe to the is we owe the slaves, and we owe the white people, who the, the non-slaveholders, right? Mm -hmm. But there's no way we can pay all of them because we don't have anywhere near the resources to do that, what we should pay. So, so I, I think that, I don't think Lincoln was, I think, as, as Bruce implied, I mean, he was, he was offering to pay because he thought maybe there, you know, it was a, he wanted to offer a hand. Exactly. He wanted to offer a hand. You right. know, you exhaust every opportunity before you. Yeah. Uh, and, and that had been offered as a solution to the end of slavery or back that had been to the revolutionary days. Oh, really? Was right. it, you know, mm -hmm. that, that these people have had that and we've got to do something rather than just take away their property. And always the reference, and even in his thing here, that the slaves were property. Well, the the were. people who had them thought they were property. Right. Yeah, true. well. Well, they had had compensated uh, emancipation in DC. Yes, yeah, that was That's true. That's it here. But that was compensating the slavery owners, not the slaves. The oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. All of these were. Were the, <laughs> no, the, yeah. the person yeah. who talked about compensating the slaves was Sherman, actually. He was oh, 50 yeah. acres and a mule, or That's 40 right. acres and a mule yeah. guy. Um, he wanted to give everybody, and, and that sort of occurred for a while on the islands off North Carolina. Yeah. He was also, and I didn't bring this up, um, very much a proponent of getting rid of the freed slaves and sending them to Liberia, Haiti, yeah. um, Costa Rica for some reason. And he said that they were already in negotiations with, with some of the, of the governments to, to do right. that. But he, he thought that that was a very good solution. Uh, ultimately, he realized that it was not a good solution. And I mean, he was also being told it wasn't a good solution. So. Uh, but very, very few took the offer. Yeah. Anyway, the... Uh, the thing that I find, this is the ending. Well, what I wanted to go through was Frederick Douglass's uh, observation on this, on the second inauguration. He said, you could have expected that there would be a triumphal mood. It wasn't. He said, it's, it was as much under a threat of the feeling of a, a threat of assassination as the first inauguration. Mm -hmm. That there were a lot of people who were, you know, 
were quiet. Uh, you know, there were a lot of sullen people mm -hmm. in the in the area, and he was sort of fearful that something, you know, that there could be a shot ring out uh, every minute. So he's Frederick Douglass. This is Frederick Douglass. Yeah. This is Frederick Douglass. And then he says, yeah, the whole proceeding was wonderfully quiet, earnest, and solemn. There was a leaden stillness about the crowd. The address sounded more like a sermon than a state paper. Um, and then, then he emphasizes this part about slave, the wages of slavery being the war. Is this from the speech or from This is the end of okay. the second inaugural. He says, you know, if this war continues until every drop of blood is reconciled, then, I mean, he believed slavery was here. And then the one we're probably more aware of is uh, the looking toward, uh, toward reconciliation. But what, so what happens after this is that Douglas tries to go to the celebration in the house, in the White House. And uh, the, uh, and he is stopped. In reality. He is stopped by a couple creeps um, who say, you know, their orders are not to let any people of my color. So he said, well, there must be, he told them, there must be some mistake. This order couldn't have come from Lincoln. And if he knew he was at the door, I was at the door, he would desire my admission. So they tried to lead him as if they were leading him in and they were leading him out a back door. And he stopped that. So and then he said, I shall not go out of this building till I see President Lincoln. At this point, a gentleman who was passing in recognized me. And I said to him, this is his autobiography, his, his 1892 autobiography. I said to him, be so kind as to say to Mr. Lincoln that Frederick Douglass is detained by officers at the door. It was not long before Mrs. Dorsey and I didn't go with his wife. His, his wife was a white woman at the time. Um, yeah, his second wife, his first wife died. It was not long before Mrs. Dorsey and I walked into the spacious East Room and met a scene of elegance such as in this country I had never before witnessed. But he had been at the British Parliament, so he'd seen that kind of a picture. Like a mountain pine high above all others, talk about poetic language, Mr. Lincoln stood in his grand simplicity and homely beauty. <laughs> Recognizing me even before I reached him, he exclaimed, so that all around could hear him, here comes my friend Douglas. Taking me by the hand, he said, I am glad to see you. I saw you in the crowd today listening to my inaugural address. How did you like it? I said, Mr. Lincoln, I must not detain you with my poor opinion when there are thousands waiting to shake hands with you. No, no, he said, you must stop a little Douglas. There is no man in the country whose opinion I value more than yours. I want to know what you think of it. I replied, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. I am glad you liked it, he said. And I passed on, feeling that any man, however distinguished, might well regard himself honored by such expressions from such a man. Um, a very interesting guy. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And a very interesting relationship between him and Susan B. Anthony. Yeah. Um, and they're both, they're buried almost side by side. In really? upstate New York, right. In Rochester, wow. right, right next to the campus. And, um, and it's a normal stop for students to go really? to walk to the cemetery. And um, they're about 50 yards apart. <laughs> wow. My, I have a sister in Seneca Falls, oh, yeah. so I've gone yeah. through yes. some of the area. Been down there. Right. There are, there's a couple of novels about that area, which are terrific. Anyway, <laughs> there's a bookstore called the North Star, oh. you know, which is the name of one of his, the name of 
his paper, initial paper. Like he had other papers mm -hmm. after that because I, he thought of himself as an editor, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, as well as everything else. So anyway, we have uh, brought ourselves to the near conclusion. Yes. Um, and I hope you got some things. I enjoyed this. Yeah, Douglas gave a speech, I think it's somewhere around 1860. I think it's relatively famous, but the name escapes me. I can't remember. But he, the, the basic question that he was responding to, I think he was, he was responding to another speaker. It's the one in part. Scotland? I'm sorry? The one in Scotland on the Constitution? Yeah, it's on the Constitution. And you would think that Douglas would have been pretty anti Constitution because, you know, it enslaved his people all these years. But he was the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. He looked at it, you know, like you take the three fifths. He said, Well, in the free states, I get a whole load. So there's, a there's a disincentive yeah. for them to keep enslaving people. That's yeah. in my slavery class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe I watched your blog on that. I, I know yeah. I read it. Yeah, it's in there. I can't remember the place where I saw it. So yeah. I, I guess that's yeah. where I was. Yeah. Anyway, I thought it was very, I was really taken aback. I, was, I would have thought the exact opposite. I was totally amazed by the detail of that speech. Mm -hmm. you know, some of which, you know, I mean, you wonder how he could, how he could say the stuff about the fugitive slave, but, you know, because he said they weren't fugitive slaves necessarily, they were indentured servants because slaves couldn't negotiate a contract mm -hmm. to, be, to be contracted to service. They didn't contract anything. They were just not, they were just, shunted around this property. So, yeah. Lorraine. I was just, I, I was surprised when you said that he married a white woman. What courage that took for both of them. I mean, that's, I had never heard that before. That I was have been unheard of, I would think. Yeah. Uh, well, I, it wasn't too common, but you know. <laughs> no, you should go to the, uh, to his house in, uh, in DC. It's oh. there's a his house is yeah. open, and uh, I mean he he was of the it's a different era. Talk about education. I mean his whole thing. I have one of the most popular artic articles on my blog is one that is uh, one that is a quote from Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. that is. Uh, I'm not going to say it right. But the point is, once you are educated, you can't be a slave. Mm -hmm. Because it starts in the mind, mm -hmm. right? And that's where he, you know, the emphasis is on the mind, the emphasis on development and improvement. This was a concept of the American system from the beginning. It wasn't just physical improvements in standard of living. It was it was improvements in your, improving yourself. I mean, Lincoln was obsessed with improving himself, you know, and his own ability, you know, and uh, and so was Douglas. I mean, talk about self-made, you know, self-study. I mean, yeah, and un, and un, un, uneducated to begin with. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, and, but, and unbelievably brilliant. Yeah, but it, uh, you know, there's a will that has to do with that, right? right? A strong will that has to do with being educated, and that is what. But it has to be passed down. I mean, Miss Lincoln, I think, is saying in that discoveries and invention that will and determination to learn and to create and to discover has to be passed down generation to generation. If it's not, you know, you're in big trouble. I think we see that we're in big trouble. Yeah. yeah.